might actually be the most derivative one of all. I mean, Christ, the same house. Maybe so. But you forgot the first rule of surviving a stab movie. Never answer the- I'm bored. Wait! And welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking, can I have some money for my dad's blood transfusion? We're talking pussies turning into pumpkins. And we're talking, I want to fucking party. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace. And we're talking white horses. Da, da, na, na, da, na, na. Wait, are you talking about a Rorschach in someone's office? No, I'm singing Vanessa Carlton. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, not get that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 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 God. Well, everyone, go listen to Vanessa Carlton's White Houses or tell Joe to do that. Uh <laughs> I'm sorry, the only Vanessa Carlton joint I know is the... Da -na 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 -na. Oh, yes, that's the White Chick song, right? Yeah. Anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, Robert, Already great on a start. <laughs> uh, we are discussing everyone for um, the, our final episode of October. Mm -hmm. Rob Zombie's controversial, question mark, Halloween 2. Yeah, yeah. Trace, I've got, a, I've got trivia for you, Trace. Oh my god, Already? Yeah, I mean, like, the the fun kind about our podcast, not so much about the film. Oh, oh, so, okay, just about us. It's selfish. I got it. Uh, wh what is the trivia? Okay, so, how many Rob Zombie films have we covered? Mm, okay, we've done Lords of Salem. Mm -hmm. We did a double feature of Devil's Rejects and Three from Hell. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Oh, wait, no. We did House of a Thousand Corpses and something, didn't we? Yes, we did an audio commentary for Patreon on House of a Thousand Corpses. Uh, man. So this is our fifth Rob Zombie joint. Jesus. And then double bonus points. How many Halloween films have we covered? Oh, God. Um, well, we have the audio commentary on the original hitting Patreon this month. Doesn't count. It's not out yet. <laughs> um, we've done H2O. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, fuck. And we've done kills and ends. Mm hmm. And the original David Gordon Green. So, yeah, this is our fifth Halloween. And then very shortly, we will add the six with John Carpenter's. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Well, I don't plan on covering Rob Zombie's first Halloween ever. <laughs> ah, ah. Ooh, the tea. It's hot. <sighs> Man, you know, okay, so... It's interesting. Full disclosure, I, I do like this movie. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of problems. It has, a, I think there's a little too much going on, but when it's focusing on what I like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's really effective. And we should point out, everyone, that we are going to be discussing the director's cut of this film. Mm -hmm. It's a weird thing because, you know, we try to figure out like where everything is accessible. And apparently if it's streaming, it's a theatrical cut. But all the Blu-rays of this movie are the director's cut. So right. because the director's cut is, in my opinion, a better film, we're going to discuss that. But we will point out the differences as we're going through. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I don't know, Joe, jo, uh, because this was a, re a, a one time rewatch for you, right? You'd only seen this once before. It was, yeah, and that was actually at your bidding, so I can't remember how many years ago, but it would have been, you know, within the last five or so. Uh, I double-billed both of the Rob Zombie Halloween Oof. films, and literally, that first film must have done a mind wipe on me, because when I was re-watching this, the only thing I remembered from two was Sherry Moon Zombie and the White Horse. Nothing else felt like I had seen it before. It was wild. Yeah, I mean, so if I, this is the thing, too, so... The last time I watched this movie, it was during a Halloween franchise marathon. And I saw this movie in theaters back in 2009. I hated it. Like, I walked out of that theater just livid. And I was off, I should also point out, I was double featuring it with The Final Destination, which also opened up that same weekend. Oh, boy. Yeah. So it was not a good <laughs> no. weekend for a horror. And then, yeah, I got that the, the Screen Factory box set, and it came with this director's cut. And, I, and everyone kept telling me, you know, watch the director's cut. Watch the director's cut. It's much better. Mm -hmm. And I did. And it is actually quite a bit better. Yeah. But I will say, I, I liked it a little bit less on this rewatch. Just, just a oh. smidge. So okay. I had given the director's cut a three and a half out of five whenever I went through the marathon. When you don't watch it immediately after the dumpster fire that is his first remake, it's not <laughs> quite as impressive. So I downgraded right. it to a three. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't mind this. I agree with you that there's definitely some sticking pain points. But overall, I found this, 
I mean, I was going to say, I found this inoffensive, but that's not quite right. Ooh, yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mind the watch. Like, I felt like the pacing was okay. The two hours didn't feel totally painful. There are some really, really effective moments in this, but I will say it is a bit weird to go into it having not watched the first film because this film literally picks up right afterwards. Very much so, which it's it's doing the original Halloween 2 and then mm-hmm. it tricks you with the dream sequence and then yes. it's like, nope, this is Rob Zombie's Totally Halloween different. Two. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> which, again, uh, wow, I would have been 20 when I saw this in theaters. I didn't like that. I was like, no, where's my Halloween 2? Where's my hospital? Right. Where's my hospital set pieces? <laughs> Interestingly enough, though, I actually think the film is the least, well, I think it's the least effective with Malcolm McDowell's on screen. Ooh, okay. I get what he's trying to do with the Loomis character. I just Mm -hmm. don't think we have time for it. Okay, you know what? That's fair. I will agree with that because I actually quite like what he's doing, but he's not in it quite enough to make it land. Exactly. And I think Laurie, and all the stuff with Laurie and Annie is the best part. I do think that sometimes when we get into the Michael kill sequences, like that strip Mm -hmm. club sequence goes on for so long. Yes. Yeah. The kill sequences are definitely in here to gratify the people who are looking for gore. And I think it is really effective, but Mm -hmm. sometimes it feels like it's at odds with the more melancholy examination of grief and PTSD, which is ironic because that's not words I would have said about this film, but I am putting it into comparison with David Gordon Green's oeuvre, and this does feel more successful. Well, that's the interesting thing, though, right? The whole time I was watching this, I was like, you know, whenever David Gordon Green's film came out, people kept talking about, oh, it's dealing, I mean, look, we've made fun of the trauma stuff, but like, in all (laughs) serious, in all seriousness, I feel like people forgot not only that Halloween h2o existed and dealt mm-hmm. with final girl ptsd right this one does and absolutely i think that this film so i think halloween h2o is the most entertaining like sure. story of final girl ptsd this is the most realistic and therefore upsetting version mm-hmm. of final girl ptsd and then yeah. david gordon greens falls kind of somewhere in the middle let's just not talk about it yeah mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but no, but like, that's the thing is, like, I remember and that that is the big difference between the director's cut and the theatrical cut. So outside of the ending being completely different, the focus, like, it's not like, oh, we have different plot points or anything. But the focus of the film is more so on Lori's PTSD, on her right. relationship with Annie and to a lesser extent, Sheriff Brackett. But it's interesting because, you know, we have a couple of additional or alternate scenes, but most of the changes, because I should point out that the director's cut is like 15 minutes longer than the theatrical cut. Yeah, it's substantial. So I was surprised when you said a lot of them are just scenes that have been extended or in the case of the theatrical cut, cut. Well, but okay, but here's the thing, though. It makes a huge difference because if you watch a theatrical cut, the version of Lori we have, like, yes, she does snap after she um, reads Loomis's book, Mm -hmm. but she seems to have it all together beforehand. Like, she has moments where she's like, oh, my God, like, that time. Oh, because that's the other thing. Uh, The theatrical cut takes place a year after the first film as opposed to two years like the director's cut does. Mm -hmm. But she's like, oh, yeah, like, that sucked a year ago. You know what? I'm doing okay. Right. And all these scenes where she's doing okay, there's like an extra 30 seconds that is cut and <laughs> added into the, the director's cut where, where she she's goes, not doing okay. <laughs> but there are like extra 15 or 30 seconds added onto scenes in the director's cut mm-hmm. where Lori does snap. Like, you know, she starts out okay and then someone says something and it just sets her off. And right. the downside of the theatrical cut is that it makes Lori a lot less likable when she does lose it because. Mm-hmm. Everything we've seen before has indicated that she is fine, so it comes out of nowhere. Whereas the director's cut, it doesn't make Laurie any more likable, but it Mm -hmm. does make her more empathetic. And maybe even like you understand where she's coming from a lot more. Sure. And I feel like this is also a good time to remind people that we can watch movies with characters who are unlikable or difficult, and they can be women, and we can still be fine with it. Like... I get that sometimes it's easier to wash a film down when you're like, I really wanted to root for her. I get that. But we also need to accept that there is art with people who are like real people, damaged, fucked up, not always making good choices. That's called interesting, folks. Like, it doesn't always work. But I think when it's treated responsibly, it can make for entertaining, but also... Boundary pushing, transgressive, confronting, important work. And I'm not necessarily going to say Rob Zombie is checking all of those boxes here, but 
I saw a lot of reviews where people were like, well, Lori's just kind of a bitch in this one. Or, yeah. oh, God, all she does is cry, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, because she suffered a huge fucking traumatic event. Well, but that's the thing, though. The, the director's cut does a better job of exploring that. Mm-hmm. Whereas the theatrical cut does not. And it's just because of a bunch of these like 15 to 30 second like ends of scenes that they chopped off. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's wild, folks. You can totally make a different film in the edit. Well, and I will say, though, there, and we'll talk about it when we get there, but there is an extra scene with Margot Kidder's therapist that I mm. – that is not in the theatrical cut. And it is – a crime. It's important, right? It's very important. Like, it's yeah. very much like a, oh, she is not okay. <laughs> Sidebar. Margot fucking Kidder's in this I movie. I totally forgot. Well, I also think that's kind of metatextual because Margot Kidder mm-hmm. has, you know, famously battled, had, sorry, when she was alive, battled with mental illness, specifically bipolar disorder. So I, mm-hmm. I have to believe it was a conscious decision on Zombie's part when he cast her in that role. I think that and we're doing legacy, not quite final girl, but famous for a horror slasher. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, everyone, Black Christmas. Um, yeah. Although many people may remember her instead as Lois Lane, I guess. Of but. course. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's also, by the way, a ton of people in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it was, you forget sometimes that Zombie does have a certain pull, right? Particularly with actors of a certain generation. In some ways, he's a, this is going to sound so fanboy wankish. He's a bit like a horror Quentin Tarantino where yeah. it feels like he rescues beloved actors from like retirement or b movies and says hey want to come back and be in this weird role in one of my mega fucked up films that's the thing i was like i'm surprised meg foster wasn't here d wallace would have been in it if she wasn't killed in the first film so right although that doesn't stop him from bringing his wife back in mm. all of these dream sequences I, okay so here's and like, we'll get into this soon but i i don't mind the sherry I think she's fine she it's fine i mean look can i see someone watching this and being like wow zombie like stroke your ego a little bit like you're just doing this pretentious like dream psychology stuff yes and i i do kind of think that's what it is so i i did watch not only the theatrical cut and the director's cut i did watch the commentary with zombie oh shit trace i know so i've seen this movie three times so in the past week (laughs) no wonder you dropped it down a star um, no, but it, 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 I, I was hoping for a bit more insight to the psychology of the film in his commentary. And uh, unfortunately, okay. I didn't really get that. Huh. I do think he's fascinating to listen to, but it also like this particular commentary, he he's more technical uh, and it does kind of sound like he's burned out. Oh, interesting. I did know that this film had a shorter pre-production schedule than his original. So I wonder if he was just like. I mean, it depends on when he recorded the audio commentary, but I wonder if he was just like, yeah, I've been doing this for a while. And it's probably hard to be on the receiving end of Halloween fans who don't like what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, truthfully, like, I don't think he cares. But (laughs) but as we said on every single Rob Zombie episode we've covered, I'm like, you know, it doesn't always work for me, but I I admire his audacity and at least his willingness to say, fuck it, I'm doing what I want, except in the case of that first movie. Yeah, I mean, folks, we have not been the kindest friends to David Gordon Green. See also our Exorcist Believer episode that just dropped on the Patreon this week. But You gotta say, I mean, when you're looking at what Rob Zombie does with a famous franchise IP, he is taking weird big swings, and I have to appreciate that. Don't you see that? That's what I was talking about last week with the the Bloodline, the Hellraiser Bloodline connection, where I was like, you know, it doesn't all work, but Mm -hmm. I I almost admire it for being so daring and ambitious and and unwilling to, to play within, like, franchise rules. Well, yes, and I know you're going to elaborate on that's how we sold Zombie to come back and make this movie. Right. So I'll leave oh, that yeah. to you. Okay, well, here, let's, 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 yeah, let's just jump right. We'll jump right in. We're like 10 minutes in. <laughs> 15 <laughs> no, minutes. No, we're the famous <laughs> podcasters from the me. No, <laughs> let's dive right in 40 minutes later. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, well, so Zombie's remake of John Carpenter's Halloween was released on August 31st, 2007 and opened to $26 million and went on to gross $58 million domestically and $22 million internationally for a worldwide gross of $80 million against a production budget of $15 million. Sidebar, those international numbers are shockingly low. I think the whole thing's kind of low. And I, mm-hmm. I remember, like, I remember seeing, com- I feel like the, the trailer for it came out very late. I don't remember a huge marketing 
push. It wasn't screened for critics. So it was one of those things where it was like, this spells doom. Sure. And Zombie was still not beloved by horror people, right? Like there were people who liked his Carnage Candy in Devil's Rejects and House of a Thousand Corpses. But I think a lot of people were uncertain whether he could make a film for a mass audience. Which, I mean, I guess out of all of his films, the the, the most commercially... right. Yeah, well, I would say the first one. I don't think this is very commercially. I mean, this is <laughs> this is not a pleasant film to watch. <laughs> hmm, okay. I mean, maybe you disagree. <laughs> I don't know. I, I legitimately, it sounds so fucking weird to say, I had a good time watching this movie. No, but, but well. For like horror perspective. <laughs> we will elaborate on that. <laughs> mm-hmm. But okay, so after that movie, I mean, it was a success, um, but it wasn't clear if Zombie was going to return to the director's chair because... Well, I don't think he wanted to come back because no. the, the the big story is, yes, he wanted to make his movie. The studio wanted to make, which is the Weinstein Company, uh, mm-hmm. wanted to make just a cut and paste remake of Carpenter's film. So what we have in that original film and the reason I don't like it, it's not even because we're getting like, oh, it's backstory for Michael Myers, which whatever. Sure. It really does feel like two compromised visions because we have mm-hmm. the first 50 minutes, which is a prologue of what Zombie wanted to do. And the, the the remaining 45 minutes of that movie is the original 90 minute film condensed into 45 minutes. And so yeah. and it feels like it. it. It really does. It just it really doesn't work for me. Um, Again, I can appreciate him trying to delve into Michael's history, even though it's the typical Rob Zombie, like, yeah, lower class family type thing. Uh huh. Podunk kid turns out to be a serial killer. Got yeah. it. I mean, I also remember my look. Truthfully, I didn't like Laurie Strode in that movie because also, like, I think her first line is joking about like fucking a donut or something, and I was like, this isn't Laurie Strode. <laughs> this is a choice. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so he even went so far as to say that the exhaustion of creating that film uh, made him not want to come back for a sequel. Right. So when he didn't want to come back, producer Malika Khadi, he's like the big franchise producer in the wine scenes, mm-hmm. were like, you know what? Why don't we get those guys that just did Inside? Um, or what? what is the French name of that movie, Joe? À l'intérieur. À l'intérieur. <laughs> <laughs> Um, they were like, yeah, cool. That came out in 2007, the same year Zombies Halloween did. Um, they're obviously a huge talent. Let's mm-hmm. get them. And this was reported by Dread Central in November of 2008 that they were going to be in talks to direct. And this is Julian Mori and Alexander Bustillo. Right. And you see, though, in an interview with Shock Till You Drop that same year, Malik Akkad said that before Zombie agreed to come back, the idea was to create a quote unquote normal sequel. Um, <laughs> what does that mean? I think it means more like we're just going to redo Halloween 2. Sure. Okay. That does make sense. Well, they'd hired, you know, uh, Maury and Bustillo uh, to come up with drafts for the new film, but none of it worked. So Akkad, along with the Weinsteins, turned to them. But, like, <sighs> Akkad thought that something got lost in the translation whenever uh, Maury and Bustillo were brought on board, and he realized he just trusted Rob Zombie too much to pass it on to them. So oh, weird. Okay. I don't, I don't know if they got the boot before Zombie agreed to come back or if he said, fuck it, fire them. I'm going to try to get Zombie and if all this fails, we'll figure something out. But th- that's the interesting thing, too, though, because Maury and Bustillo did move on to another major horror franchise, mm-hmm. the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which uh, also had a lot of problems because they filmed that in like 2015 and it was shell for two years. Yeah, they've had a bad history of trying to make it stateside. And folks, if you don't know, when we say inside or a l'intérieur, we're talking about French filmmakers. So they've struggled to translate their new French extremity vision over here. But obviously, they keep picking these really gory properties, which would seem to work with their sensibilities. Absolutely. And honestly, Leatherface isn't, t- it's extremely mediocre, but it's mm-hmm. not the worst entry in that franchise. <laughs> Oh, boy, that franchise. Yeah. Um, But anyway, so it was then that Akkad went to Zombie and told him to ignore any rules they had set for him on the previous film. He wanted Zombie to move the franchise away from some of its established rules. And this was enticing enough to bring Zombie back. And he also said after a year of cooling down, he was more open to the idea. (laughs) Right. Uh, No one else is banging on my door. And I just got carte blanche. Yeah. I also just wonder, too, if it's like. How do you follow up Rob Zombie's Halloween? Like, do you, do you want to copy the style of it? Are you going to do something mm-hmm. completely different? Like, what, what? And you can't, right? Like, you can't say, oh, it's a sequel to that film, but also we got rid of a distinct visual style. Well, because I think, too, it's shot in 16 millimeter, because these both oh. of these movies look grainy as fuck. They do, which is, to me, part of his aesthetic until we get to, like, the monsters. 
Absolutely, which I, I still haven't seen, but I feel I feel like I'm going to be in the very small crowd that do like it, but we'll see. Hmm. So instead of focusing on Michael, Zombie chose to look more at the psychological consequences on Lori after the events of the remake. And, you know, again, this isn't really unexplored territory, but what he did change quite drastically is the character of Dr. Loomis. Right. He characterized him in the sequel as more of a sellout who exploits the memories of those who were killed by Michael, but he was channeling specifically uh, Vincent Boyosi, Bu- uh, the lawyer who prosecuted Charles Manson and then, you know, co-wrote Helter Skelter. <laughs> uh, I've also read that Dr. Phil was an influence on this version oh, of Dr. Loomis. Yikers. He did say he wanted Loomis to be more ridiculous this time, and on that level, I do think he succeeds. Uh... It's funny, my memories are hazy of that first one. So this to me felt on par. It's just that he was being he was being the same in more ridiculous situations, like more uh, high profile situations. Yeah, so he's definitely not this way in the first movie. And that's where Oh, okay. Because what this movie's trying to do is like, okay, like let's look at how this trauma affects like different people. The way mm-hmm. Loomis because Loomis, by the end of that first film, you think he's dead. Like his eyes get gouged out, although right. clearly not. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's mostly like the stand up guy that uh Donald Pleasance was. And so it's a real like 180 degree turn to this film. I think that's something you can say where it's like, yeah, like this is how he's dealing with his trauma. I just don't think it works as well for him as it does for Laurie Strode. Sure. Yeah. As we said, I just don't think there's enough of him here. Mm -hmm. So what you do see of him is a man who's being ridiculous and very, very insensitive. Well, and he's sequestered, right? He doesn't deal with any of our main characters until the very end of the film. Right. Yeah. Which seems deliberate. We've got a lot of isolated characters in this film. Apparently, so for Zombie, the big emotional climax for Loomis is when he faces off against Sheriff Brackett, and he wanted to keep them apart for so long because they're together for most of that first film. Okay. I mean, that does make sense Mm -hmm. from a character art perspective. Yeah. Uh, It's just that he's stuck with that woman from Reno 911, who is really funny in this movie, but then just the movie just forgets about her. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean our queer character of note, Trace? Oh, okay. I didn't know if she was actually a lesbian. You mean when he calls her a carpet muncher? (laughs) Yes. That's director's cut, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. Good to know. I, I will say, as a caveat, I do have a queer reading for this film. I don't... I, I, I feel like I know what it's going to be, but we'll see. Okay. Uh, so they give this a $15 million budget, the same as the first film, and production begins on February 23rd, 2009 in Atlanta, Georgia, and hmm. concluded on April 9th of that same year. There were issues, like, as you said, this is a rush pre-production. It seemed to also be a rush production. There was also a day where, like... I need to detail this in the commentary where they had done like a really long, stressful day of shoots and it was just really mm-hmm. hard to get all the shots in. And whoever was traveling with it um sent it under the x-ray at the airport. <gasps> oh fuck. And they lost every single no. bit of footage. Some of it was the ambulance stuff, so they had to fly Richard Brake back in from London where he lives to like reshoot all of his stuff and he was jet lagged, oh. no sleep. Like a lot of stuff like that was happening on this set. <laughs> My soul just died a little bit. I mean, you and I have had conversations where something has gone wrong when we're editing this podcast. And it's like, oh, I just lost, you know, 90 minutes yep. or I lost like 20 minutes or something. And we hate it. I couldn't imagine just the sheer volume of workload that goes into making a film, especially on a tight deadline, and then just losing it and being like, and now we have to do it again. Exactly. And not even on an easy day of shoots either. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, no, we lost that scene where Lori's just talking to Annie over the breakfast table. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but yeah, so um, the Weinstein Company under their Dimension Films banner released Halloween 2 in North America on August 28th, 2009. Uh, other new releases that weekend were, as I said, the franchise sequel, The Final Destination, the fourth entry in that franchise. Boo. Well, and then one second. Um, and, and the other one was the Dimitri Martin, Paul Dano, 60s bash taking Woodstock. So I sure could not tell you anything about that one. I forgot Dimitri Martin existed. Sure. But anyway, so by the end of its opening weekend, Halloween 2 had grossed $16.3 million, which was about $10 million less than what the first one had made its opening weekend. Mm-hmm. But it landed in third place. First place went unsurprisingly to the final destination, which was banking on all those 3D ticket dollars and made $27 million that opening weekend. Pretty good, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, th- th- there's a reason why. That I think that might be the most it's successful the highest film grossing in the franchise. One. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. 
But yeah, second place went to Inglorious Bastards, which earned 19 million. Unfortunately, this movie did not have a good holdover, so it dropped out of the top 10 by its third weekend. So the Weinstein Company re-released the film on Halloween weekend, trying to get some like extra bucks from it. Sure. As in, why didn't you release it in October in the first place? Well, because the first one was also in. It literally was released exactly two years after that first movie. Uh, okay, I guess. Yeah. Well, nevertheless, it only brought in um, 475 grand <laughs> over that weekend, so I don't even think it plays in the top 10. Ouchie. Yeah, so by the end of its run, it grossed $33.4 million in North America and an additional $6 million overseas for a worldwide gross of $39.4 million. <sighs> yeah. So, folks, the math does not add up. It does make its production budget back and a little bit more, but you needed to multiply it by three. And this is nowhere near there. Yeah. And I think, well, so leading into the critical reception, I think that it, this movie was just so hated at the time when it came out. It's wild. But by critics and fans alike. I mean, like, I. I <laughs> I nobody liked it. I didn't know a single person who liked this movie. Weird. Up until I started hearing about this director's cut. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. Sorry. I keep forgetting we're talking about the theatrical, which is well, the not good one. And you know, I'm not a Rob Zombie hater. I'm not exaggerating here. I literally, in my little bubble, I had never met a single person <laughs> who liked <laughs> Halloween too. <laughs> okay. But. On Rotten Tomatoes, it's got a 23% with an average score of 4.2 out of 10. Uh, Metacritic, it's got a 35 out of 100. And Letterbox users have, quote unquote, awarded it a mm. 4.6 out of 10. Oh, no Razzies? Come on. No Razzies, no. Um, but I do want to point out, because I mean, like, we know it eventually leads to the David Gordon Green film. But on August 30th of that year, so the same fucking weekend this came out, mm -hmm. the next film in the series, Halloween 3D, was announced to be uh, the next film in the franchise by the Weinstein Company. And according to a Games Radar article that went up that same weekend, it was planned to be released in 2010, so a year later, mm -hmm. retroactively establishing Laurie to have killed Loomis instead of Mike with Todd Farmer and Patrick Lussier um, yes. writing the film. And, and you know why they're writing it, though, because they either wrote or directed in some capacity both Drive Angry 3D and My mm -hmm. Bloody Valentine 3D. So I love them a three. Well, I think because because this was beat by the final destination in 3d the wine scenes were like shit let's do that <laughs> and they wanted writers and directors who could write for yes. 3d and direct for 3d. Yes, you know what? I'm remembering we did talk about this when we did our My Bloody Valentine 3D audio commentary. Right. Yes, yes, yes. And Patrick Lucier is, of course, he, he's like a, he's a, mostly an editor. He's done a lot of Wes Craven's mm -hmm. films, but he's directed a handful of films. Yeah, and they're all okay. Yeah, well, the 3D ones are fun. The non-3D <laughs> ones are um, not great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they ultimately scrapped this idea, and admittedly this particular tidbit is from wikipedia it says that bob and harvey weinstein decided to green light and prioritize scream 4 instead which is part of the reason why mm. halloween 3d was canceled um weird okay i just think it was like i just think it sounds like a horrible bitch to make like i mean like th these two didn't seem like a walk in the park <laughs> mm -mm. <laughs> so i think they just cut their i i, I remember reading bloody disgusting at the time and every day it seemed like there was an article about halloween 3d this and halloween 3d that before finally right. it just like petered out yeah, here's the thing. If this movie had made the same amount as that first film, or even just a little bit less, I do think we probably would have seen it, and it probably would have been from somebody other than Zombie. Oh, yeah. But the reality is, is that as soon as they saw the box office figures, they probably just said, yeah, okay, never mind. But they were trying to get that 3D going for the longest fucking time. <laughs> God, that 3D boom in the late 2000s, just the worst fucking looking movies too i know i know i mean honestly the only like good ones are like are things like my buddy valentine or drive angry where it's like they're campy b movies yeah the schlocky ones that just knew how to embrace it i i will never if i never hear the words post converted <laughs> again yeah well halloween still has not had a 3d entry yet no <laughs> you know what <laughs> maybe one day folks i mean uh we'll, we're waiting on that tv show now yeah but uh, okay, that's it. Let's talk about this movie. Okay. So we open with an excerpt from the <laughs> subconscious psychosis of dreams. I, okay. So yeah. as I said, I don't hate this. I think mm -hmm. the issue is because this film feels so different from that first film because it is Rob Zombie's more like his vision. There are things that get lost when it's like, oh, like 
this wasn't a thing in the movie <laughs> last mm-hmm. time. So we're just re- we're introducing this because we can. Yeah, and again, it's it's hard to critique it in some ways because Rob Zombie came back because he wanted to do things his own way and he got permission to do mm-hmm. so. We're seeing it right off the top of the film here. At the same time, this feels this feels like we're trying to elevate the film yes. above its standard in a way that just feels very, oh, yes, I went to college, I've got a degree, and here I'm just going to show you how smart I am. Like, I don't know that the film needs something like this, particularly when we are going to go through it in conversation, in character development throughout the film. Yeah, and I mean, look, I get it. Everything Sherry Moon Zombie is saying is meant to represent Michael's thoughts. I sure totally get that. And then we're, we're also bringing in a bit of the Jamie Lloyd by Myers like psychic connection from those uh, Halloween's uh-huh. four through six where we're like okay like it, the same thing's happening with Laurie and Michael here so yes in a way like it's still kind of mm-hmm. it kind of works yeah yeah well it's still doing what other franchise entries have done just in a very Rob Zombie way um yes. but again I think because because we have all the Loomis stuff because we have Laurie's other group of friends that we have to deal with too mm-hmm. there isn't even though this is a two hour movie there isn't really enough time to let all of this feel anything more than like surface level psychoanalysis yeah I may have written in my notes a lot of this feels pop psychology yes very much so and again I don't think it's bad by any means it's just kind of there yeah yeah and and to be honest I just don't think this is a smart way to begin your movie like so after this we open with Deborah Myers who is played by Sherry Moon Zombie and she as we learn this is a flashback where we're seeing her visit a preteen Michael who was played by Chase Wright Vanek in a sanitarium. And this is where he outlines a dream of her next to a white horse. And we'll see this recurring image throughout the film. I think that this would have been a fine way to open the movie. Like, I don't know that you needed that excerpt to set the stage. Well, it's it's very much a the audience might be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> maybe but i don't think the excerpt helps stupid people feel smart <laughs> no no it makes them feel like oh this movie's preaching to me or talking down to me or something yeah exactly i mean look whenever you mention this movie i feel like the first thing people say is oh the fucking white horse and sherry Moon zombie and it's like mm-hmm. yeah i mean it's, it's just dream imagery you just go with it yeah it's it, it is what it is and look is it a reason for him to bring his wife back into this movie probably yes. but hey <laughs> you and i are on record we like sherry Moon zombie Mm-hmm. I, ah, fuck, because we haven't discussed that first film, but I will say, for anyone who gets mad at me about defending Sherry Moon Zombie all the time, right? I do think her worst acting moment ever is in that first film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's a part where um the principal showing her all these photos of dead animals that um that michael has killed and they were in his backpack or something and she's looking at these photos going oh oh this is really sick and it's like bitch you don't think this is sick it's not very convincing <laughs> here's the thing i remember you told that story when we talked about lords of salem because you uh. and adrian both guffawed at it <laughs> oh this is this is really sick i mean uh, like what what <laughs> Guys, this is really sick. (laughs) Anyway, we get screams and gunshots, and then we are back on the ground immediately after the bloodbath from the first film. Uh, I will say... I found this a little bit confusing. So we're we're picking people up in stretchers. So we are seeing Lori, who is played by Scout Taylor Compton. She gets relieved of her gun by Sheriff Lee Brackett, who, of course, is played by Brad Dourif. Mm -hmm. But then I actually got confused when we see Annie, who is played by Danielle Harris, being prepped for the stretcher and going into surgery. I was like, wait, is that Lori or is that Annie? And it right. it wasn't clear to me. Yeah, it's because I think at the end of that first movie, like we don't we don't know if Annie's dead by the end of the <laughs> first movie. Like like she gets like stabbed a bunch, but I think Lori finds her and then Michael like get, goes after her. So she, we, we don't have time to spend with Annie. Right. Yeah. So this is wrapping up a loose end. And of course, we'll see a lot more of Danielle Harris in this film. Spoiler alert. She's fucking great in this movie. Yes. No, she she is the best part of both of these movies. She is. It's funny to say this. The heart of this film. This is this inky black heart. I will say, too, (laughs) I I was a Scout Taylor Compton hater for the longest time because I didn't like her interpretation of Laurie Strode, even though that's Rob Zombie's right. interpretation of Laurie Strode. Um, yeah. I have come around. I do think she actually does really good work here. I agree. Yeah. 
as we said, I don't think she's a likable character at points. She can be frustrating. Uh, sometimes it can feel like, okay, Laura, you just need to calm down because, girl, you spiraling. But at the same point, all of it feels very real based on what the character is going through or, or has been through. And I do, I, I do, look, y'all, if y'all are listening to this and you haven't seen this in 2009 or you've never seen this movie, I actually think it does play better today in a post, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I'm gonna, it's not a Me Too movie, but like in a post Me Too world, I think this plays better than it would have in 2009. I think we're all just, we're a little bit more comfortable talking about feelings and saying, hey, when you go through some bad shit, you don't just immediately get better by the next film or the next year or something like that. Well, I also think with that knowing that this is not the last Halloween film that's ever going to get made and we have those David mm. Gordon Green films, it's easier to look at this as an interesting experiment than like the be all mm -hmm. end all of the Halloween franchise. Yeah, that is a problem with franchise entries, right? What if this is the last one we ever get and it did mm -hmm. this yeah. and I don't like it? A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay, so Annie is going into surgery. Dr. Loomis, played by Malcolm McDowell, is also being taken away on a stretcher. And then we have two coroners. So we have <laughs> Coroner Hooks, who is played by Dayton Callie, as well as Coroner Scott, who is played by Richard Brake. And they are taking adult Michael Myers' body away in their white van. Michael is played by Tyler Maine. And of course, he is fucking ginormous because he is an ex-wrestler oh my god you want to hear an embarrassing story about me sure you wanked it to him wait I what <laughs> <laughs> i was at a convention in texas uh texas primary weekend which is like a monthly mm -hmm. like uh, sorry an annual horror convention they have in dallas every year and i this is probably like eight years ago and i ran into tyler main and I, he wasn't at his table and i was just like why were you grunting so much when you were killing people in halloween too like michael <laughs> oh michael God. myers doesn't i was being that fucking fan no and he just looked at me and was like well if you were stabbing someone a bunch of times over and over wouldn't you make some noise and i was just mm -hmm. like i mean i guess oh. but michael myers <laughs> 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 so i'm sorry tyler main <laughs> you know what we revoked his his fan badge for a couple of years and now he's gotten better <laughs> Yeah, it is interesting, right? Because Michael is, I mean, I'm not going to suggest he's a verbal in this film, but he is making noise. And yes, he does have a line at some point. But... Well, oh, well and that line, though, not in the theatrical cut. Oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I will say, though, it's funny because it, I feel like this Michael Myers is closely, is more closely aligned with the Michael Myers we see in Halloween Ends. Right. Yeah, he's looking a little um a little unhoused he's been living in the woods for a while he's he's just a little raggedy but this feels weirdly like survivalist yes al almost more jason territory than michael myers territory at points i mean he flips a car over with his bare hands <laughs> he's got that i hate laurie strode strength <laughs> It's like when moms need to rescue their kids from, you know, burning cars or something that yes. just rip the doors off. Except here it's, I hate my sister so fucking much. <laughs> but all he wants to do is bring the family together, which just means kill, doing a murder-suicide, essentially. I guess, yeah. The, the core thesis of this film is, you know what? Everybody would just be happier if all the Myers were dead and in heaven <laughs> together. <laughs> Question mark. Everyone who gets in her, there has passed. Like anyone who is in close proximity to Lori, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> These poor people who have nothing to do with her, just dead. Yeah. So I will say the most egregiously rob zombie ugh moment yeah. is the conversation with these two corners where they're talking about Annie's tits and how she was hot and stuff. It's gross. I don't need this in this movie. Yeah, it's and they're talking about fucking corpses. And mm -hmm. like, this is all Richard Brake. Like, and I totally forgot this was him in this movie because me too. And mm -hmm. he will, of course, become like a Rob Zombie, like mainstay uh, starting in 31, I feel like. But um, sure. And other folks may recognize him from Barbarian. Yeah, absolutely. Um, This. Yeah, this is um, it's just ugh. egregious, I think. It, it, it's it, yeah, it, it it's here just for shock value, or yeah. or maybe this is how Rob and Sherry Moon Zombie talk a lot. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, babe, you want me to fuck that donut tonight? Well, you know, I, I think. <laughs> You know what I think they do? I think they do like those weird sex games, like how Nicole Kidman and Colin uh, Farrell do it in Killing of a Sacred Deer, where she just pretends oh, to be oh dead and he fucks her. 
Uh, yeah, reenact the Annie scene from the original John Carpenter film. Just lay on this grave and I'm going to fuck you. Yeah. Uh, but hey, do you know the difference between jam and jelly? <sighs> Moving on. You can't Ooh. jelly your cock up a dead girl's ass. <laughs> Primo dialogue. But yeah. hey, you know what? They hit a cow. Here we go. Yeah. So we do hit a cow. <laughs> <laughs> and Hooks is immediately killed, which leaves Scott, aka the more famous actor of the two. But he only survives long enough for Michael to saw off his motherfucking head. This, I, 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 can't even, I remember seeing this in theaters too. Because he, he's just, he just, he's going over and over like, fuck, 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 fuck. And then he starts changing mm -hmm. it to Hooks. And I... I remember being annoyed by this, but at the same time, I was kind of like, yeah, but I feel like this maybe is how you would react if this just happened to you. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, not a great situation. And then, well, I guess you're dead, so. Well, and Michael, uh, you know, he just looks down the road and what's standing there, but ah, oh, mama ghost and a horse. It's true. Yeah. But this is all we see of this because then we get a thunderclap and it wakes Laurie up. So in some ways, you could look at this almost as the first of the many dream sequences we're going to get in this film. Yeah, no. So Rob Zombie confirms everything that happens before this moment is real. This is the dream sequence. So it's 11 yep. minutes in and I think it goes for about 13 minutes. It is long, my friends. Mm -hmm. So uh, we come in on Nurse Daniels, played by one Octavia fucking Spencer. Um, also, her name is Octavia Daniels. It because <laughs> I, I wrote it down and then thought, no, I'm having, you know, one of my fugue states that I constantly have now because of the pandemic. And I was like, I'm writing Octavia down because that's the actress's name. And then they're like, uh, Nurse Octavia Daniels. Well, because, okay, because the other nurse, Nurse dot is uh played by caroline williams from texas chainsaw massacre 2 and leprechaun oh, 3 okay but yeah she just because she's like oh octavia you so and so mm -hmm. <laughs> i should say there are audition tapes on this blu-ray and you can Ooh. see octavia spencer's audition for this film how dare <laughs> it's octavia fucking spencer you hire her because you know who she is she no but you girl this was too this is pre the help no one knew who she was now Ah, that is wild then. Yeah. Yeah. She was not a name at this point at all. If anything, Caroline Williams was a bigger name than she was. Interesting. Okay. So, yes, Nurse Daniels, Nurse Octavia Daniels, <laughs> discovers Lori in Annie's room where she is checking on her. And, folks, if you hadn't guessed, this is my queer reading. Lori oh. <laughs> and Annie have feelings for each other. It's, I mean, because you kind of get a taste of it in that first film, but we have, it's, you know, it's Lori, Annie, and Linda. And mm -hmm. uh, Linda's played by Christina Cleave, and I really like her too. Um, but the one thing, if, if there's one positive thing you were going to get out of this movie, mm -hmm. it is this relationship between these two girls. And yeah. it will frustrate you because Lori ruins it. <laughs> but <laughs> well, Lori is really fucking messed up. And Annie is also messed up. It's just, and I'm going to give full credit to lead bloody disgusting critic Megan Navarro. She wrote a piece looking at the trauma in this movie. And she cued me to it that Annie looks like she's doing okay, but you actually never see her outside of the house. No, never. I, I feel like they shot all of her shit in like a weekend. I mean, probably, but within the world of the film, that's very telling because we see mm -hmm. Lori going to a job. She's got friends. Annie apparently has her relationship with Lori, honka honka, whatever you mm -hmm. want to make of that. And her dad, and she doesn't seem to be doing anything else. So she may look like she's functioning better than Lori on the surface, but she's also a recluse. 100%. And so neither one, neither girl is really dealing with anything mm -hmm. in a very healthy way. Although, at least Lori is going to therapy. I don't yes. think Annie is doing that. <laughs> doesn't seem like it, unless she's doing teletherapy or something like that. But we that don't see exist. that in this movie. No, that only existed in the in the Lisa Kudrow show web therapy, where that was still a joke <laughs> back then. <laughs> yes, only there. Isn't but isn't there a party that wanted to see like a crossover between Annie and then Lori's other friends? Like, didn't you want to see all of them mm -hmm. together at some point? Yeah, because Annie seems very defensive that Lori has, quote unquote, moved on with these new girls who are very clearly. I mean, they're not great characters in this film. They're interesting enough that I wish we saw more of them, but they're clearly gregarious and outgoing and they're you know kind of just normal girls for this age and annie seems threatened 
Yeah, it, it is true. Like that is the vibe she puts off. I think she even says it at one point. But at the same mm-hmm. time, like we never get to see them interact with each other, and no. that's something where I'm like, oh, like that would have been the real estate of runtime <laughs> would yes. be better spent on that than you know Malcolm McDowell like on the Chris Hardwick show. <laughs> I have thoughts. But yes, I think part of the problem with this film is that it is trying to tell several different stories about different people's coping mechanisms or how we move forward. Because you can even argue there's a bit about how does Haddonfield as a town move forward? You know, we get to see Linda's father yeah. confront Dr. Loomis and stuff. But at the end of the day, I don't always know that it's the best story to have pursued, but it feels like, oh, well, we can't close the book on Dr. Loomis, so we've got to give him something. We've got to do this other stuff. And part of me wonders if it wouldn't have been better to just say, tell a more concentrated story about just Lori and Annie and maybe Sheriff Brackett. Yeah. And then, yeah, have Michael closing in on them. I will say, though, I, I needed to hear some excerpts from from Loomis's book because outside of like, OK, yeah. he's writing a book about a tragedy that he was a part of, by the mm-hmm. way, which on its I mean, look, I get it. Like you're making money off of a tragedy, but like, this isn't the first time it's been done. <laughs> Gail Weathers has got six G- movies dude, and books. Out of it. <laughs> right. And so I'm just kind of like, like, did he write something that was horrible in this book? Was he defaming like all the victims in this mm-hmm. book? Like I, what made it so bad outside of the fact that he wrote about it and that he of course you know spoiled uh uh, uh <laughs> Lori's lineage yeah i mean based on the presentation slash sales pitch that he makes to this full auditorium later in the film i'm just gonna say he's probably a shit writer oh that's also entirely possible <laughs> <laughs> michael took out his phallic weapon and stuck it in his sister angel he killed that slut linda God, poor Linda. <laughs> Just let Linda fuck. <laughs> well, no, no, she died. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying. Instead of killing her, just let her fuck. I don't know. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Uh, we're still back at the hospital. So yeah. uh, nurse Octavia Daniels orders Lori to go back to her own bed. And then this is when she just gets brutally fucking murdered in this nurse's station. Yeah, this is... um. Oh, God, it's a lot. The Foley work, the Foley is work, yeah, off the chain. I was just like, I am hearing sounds that I have not heard before. Like someone getting stabbed 20 plus times mm-hmm. over and over and over. You have strippers heads being bashed into oh, mirror walls like yeah. over and over and over. Like this movie is mean and you could even say excessive. Uh huh. But as to, to quote you, it is effective. <laughs> it is effective. I'm not going to lie. And. This is maybe just me reading into it because of the Rob Zombiness of it. I could definitely see people labeling this film misogynistic. Um, yeah, just yeah. It, it seems to be especially punitive to women. Yeah, but it's also because most of our—I mean, well, God, maybe this is like the the, the horrible mm. person's defense of that. But it's like most of the characters in this film are women. That is true. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, so Nurse Octavia Daniels is dead. So Lori <laughs> flees. She runs to the basement. We do get this great shot where she falls into a pit of bodies, and it's lit by red light. And Ooh, director's cut, by the way. Oh, is it okay? Yeah, uh, great moment. Like it mm-hmm. looks fantastic. There's a couple of shots in this movie where I was just like, you know what? Pause the movie, print it. I'm gonna hang it on the wall. That's honestly most of Sherry Moon Zombies' appearances. I'm like, this looks really cool. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't care if the white horse stuff is stupid. Like, this <laughs> looks really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, yeah. So Laurie ends up escaping into the rain, but it's completely deserted. She can't get over the fence because she's got this fucking boot on her leg. One of her arms is in a cast. So she ends up having to hide in an empty guard shack. Michael now has an axe. And, (laughs) you know, as always in these films, we have somebody who comes in and says, oh, girl, you're going to be okay. Don't worry. And of course, she's saying he's going to kill us. You need to come inside. We need to get out of here. And they're like, girl, you a dumb fuck. What are you talking about? It'll be okay. Here, have some coffee. And then, of course, they get brutally murdered. The number of times in this movie, it's at least twice. but I think it's more where like, yeah, someone's like, oh, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. And you're just waiting for Michael Mm -hmm. to like just rush in from off frame to kill them. Like, because it happens here. It happens with fucking Sean Whalen at that car. Yep. 
and I, it happens somewhere else, but I'm just like, people, just listen to the woman. <laughs> listen to women, yeah. <laughs> so this is Buddy, the night guard, trying to be helpful. He's played by Richard Riley. And uh, yeah, we do get a fake out where he disappears and you think, oh, we're just going to get a body come through the window or something like that. And he does come back, but of course, it's only to get murdered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Riley's one of those character actors where, like, I, I, he's been in so many things, mm -hmm. but I, I always know him as one of the guys that fucks Joseph Gordon-Levitt in Mysterious Skin. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a horrible way to know I him. I know! <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, oh, boy, folks, that movie. Not a fun watch. That could be a movie we cover on the show. Oh, 100%. And I would gladly cover that movie. Oh, so I mean, good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Great movie. Terrible movie we would have a fantastic conversation. Yes. Yeah. Okay, but don't worry, everybody. This is all just a nightmare. <laughs> Trace, how do you feel about this? I'm fine with it now. Okay. Um, I was not fine with it in theaters. It's just, it's so long that yeah. it comes to a certain point where you think, oh, I guess this is the movie. And then for Zombie to pull the rug out from under us and say, don't worry, this has all just been a super fucking elaborate, lengthy dream can feel a little bit like you're getting punched in the dick. I mean, to me, it feels like he's saying fuck you to everyone who wanted a Halloween 2 remake. Yeah, you know what? He gave you a taste of it. And then he's saying, OK, now I'm going to do my thing. Sure. But like, honestly, that this rivals like Romeo and Michelle's high school reunion for like longest dream sequence ever. It's so long. <laughs> it's so long. <laughs> All right. So a card tells us it is October 29th. So we know that we've got a couple of days until the big showdown. And then the kicker comes in for the director's cut two years later. Yeah. And honestly, I think that does make a difference. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because everyone says, oh, Lord, you should be over this by now because it's not a year. It's not the next Halloween. It's bitch. You've already been through this. Why aren't you better? Because yeah. she's not. It also makes sense that it would take Loomis, you know, up to two years to write a book and not one sure. year. <laughs> yeah. Anyone who knows anything about publishing knows you don't publish a book in one year. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Okay. So Lori is now living with the brackets and she is fucking sick of everyone telling her to take it one day at a time. Well, and so here's the thing. Theatrical cut, it ends with a oh, one day at a time. OK, the mm -hmm. director's cut has her lose it and go, if someone tell me to do that one more fucking time, I'm going to lose. Yeah. Like, and then she bitches about her therapist to uh -huh. Annie. So all of this is director's cut. And you're like, oh, OK. This is the Laurie we have right now. <laughs> it's so important, though. It is setting the character's arc in place. She is not okay. She is sick and tired of people telling her that it's going to be okay. But also, she is in therapy trying to do the work. Well, and th this is where you see, like, she'll she'll be totally fine one moment and, mm -hmm. like, snap the next. So, again, yes. if, if you watch both versions, you're like, okay, she, she goes one day at a time and she smiles and then it cuts. It's a completely different performance. One because yeah, because then if if you watch the director said it doesn't cut, she just she continues one day at a time, smiles. If someone tells me that one more <laughs> fucking time, <laughs> I'm not okay. Well, and it's also fascinating to watch Annie bounce off of her because again, mm -hmm. like, yeah, as Annie will point out at some point in this film, she's not the only one who had trauma happen to her. Like Annie uh -huh. also almost died. Yeah, you can literally see it on her face oh, because she is scarred. <laughs> so we move into therapy with Dr. Barbara Collier, who is played by Margot fucking Kidder. Woo! She's great. So she is basically trying to walk Laurie off this ledge. She acknowledges that she has this holiday trigger coming up and it's okay to not be okay. And also... This is when Lori drops what I think is a really significant point. She appreciates and loves Annie, but also every time she looks at her, it is a literal physical manifestation of her trauma because she can see the scars that 100%. Michael has left. Also, director's cut, because in the theatrical cut, she just goes, I miss my parents a lot. That's it. Ugh. Come and on. so, yeah, you're right, though. We had this thing. It, 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 it hurts us to hear Lori say this about Annie, mm -hmm. who at one point in time was her best friend. But, yep. yeah, she's just this living, constant reminder of her trauma. And she can't stand to look at her, but she can't do anything because mm -hmm. she lives with her. 
Well, and also she still loves and appreciates Annie. Like she literally took Lori in after all of this. So I I love this as a dilemma where Lori can't even verbalize it to the person she's arguably most close to. Well, and it's not just like the reminder of the trauma, but she says, you know, I see those scars and I know it's my fault. So she's also like doing a lot of self blame in this film Mm -hmm. and just handling it in the exact wrong way you should be handling that. Right, but a very human way. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) So this is also, this scene ends where we look at the Rorschach image above Dr. Collier's uh, desk, sofa, whatever. Yeah. And Laurie says that it looks like a white horse. So this is the start of that psychic connection you were talking about between the siblings. Also, director's cut. (laughs) This is one I think we're fine to lose. I don't need it. It's hammering you over the head with this symbolism, but mm-hmm. I do think it's it's at least introducing the idea where it's like, okay, like, yeah, Michael and Lori have, because they're related, they have the same kind of brain mind meld going on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which, as you said, is not the first time we've explored this idea. No, not at all. So when people balk at that, I'm like, y'all, <laughs> you fuckers like the Cult of Thorn trilogy. I don't know what the fuck you're complaining about. Wow. Well. Maybe they don't. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe if that you is don't, very divisive. <laughs> if you don't like it, you're okay to not like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Concessions. Here we go. So we follow Lori as she goes to what I think is a record store, but it might just be an all encompassing kind of weird it it looked like they had vinyls, but also books, but also knickknacks and shit. Sure. I, sure. I, I put record store in my notes, but yeah, we can call it a, me- a grunge media store. Yeah. It, I mean, honestly, it looked like the kind of place I would go to to buy used DVDs. Well, fun fact, too, a lot of the, um, so the, 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 the decor in this building and also like Lori and Annie's house. Mm-hmm. It's a bunch of friends of Rob Zombies who are musicians. Like, I mean, there's right. a bunch of bands here that I couldn't even tell you who they are because it's not my scene. Sure. But they let him like without paying for it like paying for the rights just like let him use posters to hang up on their walls oh nice okay that's fun Mm -hmm. so she has a boss named uncle meat who is played by howard hessman and then she has two co-workers maya who is played by filmmaker and actress Bria grant as well as harley who is played by angela trimber you remember who angela trimber is right I did not recognize the name, but the actress looked very familiar. She is the dumb slut in The Final Girls. (gasps) No! Yeah, yeah. We love her! We love her! Uh, She was diagnosed with breast cancer back in 2018. I think she's in recovery now, but she's like a big activist now. Oh, well, that's a downer. Yeah, unfortunately, (laughs) her character is not a character. No. Harley comes in calling them dick lickers. She's definitely the uh, the raunchy girl of the group. Yeah. I actually really like Bria Grant's Maya and wish sure. she had more screen time. I want more of both of these girls, especially since it seems like we're setting up, oh, this is a new threesome, you know? <laughs> Not in a sexual way. No, I know. Just I know, a friendship threesome. But it definitely feels like, oh, this is proof that Lori is trying to get back to some sense of normalcy. She is quote-unquote replacing the friends that she lost in the last year's or two years ago's massacre also i love that okay so even though we have all these like musicians that are letting rob zombie use their like image and whatever Mm -hmm. we can't say rocky horror because (laughs) (laughs) so harley's like oh my god i got you that sick maid outfit and it's like (laughs) when you finally see it you're like oh it's it's magenta come on magenta okay i was like it's columbia but no columbia is who maya plays yes (laughs) Also, those costumes are on point. Like, no, those dude. were not dollar store costumes. Harley's Frankenfurter? I was like, you look like Tim Amazing. Curry. Amazing. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> I got to step my game up. So mm-hmm. I'm a chick playing a dude who wants to be a chick. <sighs> I, I know. mean, no, that's a fundamental misreading of Rocky Horror, but sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, but again, if they could have just said I'm Frankenfurter from Rocky mm-hmm. Horror. <laughs> problem and crisis averted yeah yeah okay so we move to the big city so that we can introduce dr loomis as he is demeaning his carpet muncher assistant nancy who is played by mary birdsong and i again think that this is an interesting character this assistant publicist and she's basically just here to be a bit of an audience mouthpiece and say hey dr loomis you're gross 
Yeah, I'm a little surprised she doesn't die in this movie. A hundred percent. Because, yeah, I, I, it's the movie just flat out forget she exists. After she tells Loomis in the car, uh-huh. your book crosses a few fucking lines. That's just to have him fire her. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I, I love her little bob. Mm-hmm. Love her hair. But yes, uh, my deputy Cherisha Kimball from Reno 911. <laughs> sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, Loomis sucks. He is a huge piece of shit. Yeah, he's here to promote his new book, The Devil Walks Among Us. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets up on stage in front of this quote unquote very receptive audience, or at least that's what he has been forewarned by Nancy. And. They don't quite tear him to pieces, but it's not a very warm reception. Okay, two things. One, we have this, like, he shows footage of him, like, interviewing young Michael Myers, Mm -hmm. where he's telling him, hey, your mom is dead. Yep. And (laughs) she's like, your mother's passed away. Oh, well, she'll be back. And he's like, no, (laughs) she won't be coming to see you anymore. (laughs) Yeah. Need to explain how death works to this child. Oh, maybe that's why he grows up to be a serial killer who doesn't understand death. But then he yells at this entire room full of people like, listen, you fucking brain Brain dead dead gossip gossip mongers. mongers. (laughs) Just like, oh, um, that's not going to help your book sales. Also, I'm sorry. I if you're a journalist, a reporter, I would be saying this person is dead if no body was ever fucking found. That and even just this weird suggestion, I don't think it's here, I think it's a little bit later, but this idea that he is somehow responsible for Michael's carnage. I mean, I'm sure it does happen, but that seems like especially bad journalism. No, because it's a thing where it's like in the original film where it's like Loomis warned people, don't fucking let him out. Don't do this. Don't Mm -hmm. do this. And they ignored him. So he was like the scapegoat for it. Sure. Yeah. But the film isn't saying that in no. so many ways. <laughs> no, 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 no. And, and that's the thing is like the Loomis stuff. Again, I get what, what Zombie is going for here, but mm-hmm. it, it's it's too much of a caricature and almost borderline right. parody, which feels so at odds with the more serious nature of the rest of the film. You know what? I can't disagree with you, but it didn't, didn't bother, bother you? me. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's fine. I mean, here, I think it's because Malcolm McDowell is... I don't know if I could say he looks like he's having fun, but he is biting off pieces of scenery. Like, I could understand if people said, oh, Malcolm McDowell, he's being a little campy in this performance. Definitely campy. Yes. I mean, like... (laughs) Gentle camp. He is a caricature. That is what this character is in this movie. Right. Maybe I appreciated some of the levity because I did find the Laurie stuff so dark. I mean, that is totally fair. Hmm. Okay. Are you ready for more dreamlike imagery? Oh my god, I I call her Ghost Mama in all of my notes. <laughs> Very fair. Every time I wrote out her actual name, Deborah, it just felt so wrong. Well, because, I think I had Mom in my notes because it's spelled Deborah, like all about evil. Oh my god! <laughs> you know what? <laughs> now I'm going to change it. I'm going to call it Deborah for the rest Deborah of this episode. Myers. <laughs> Deborah Miles. Okay, so in dreamlike imagery, this is where Michael sees his dead mother. Deborah. And so he follows her to this farmhouse. This is where he is confronted by two men. Uh, One of them is played by character actor Mark Boone Jr. He kind of gets the crap beaten out of him, but he's Michael Myers, so we know it's only going to put him down for a couple of seconds. And then he makes quick work of these two men as well as their female companion. Fun fact, the, the female companion, who I think is the daughter of one of them. Yes, because she keeps saying, Daddy. Daddy, daddy, daddy. Um, she is played by Betsy Rue, and she is the girl who went all full frontal in her kill scene in My Bloody Valentine 3D. There we go. It's a beautiful, vicious circle. Yeah, this is, again, I mean, like, this isn't to me as egregious as the strip club scene, but because mm-hmm. I'm, yeah, we're catching up with Michael, whatever, people find him, he kills them. Yeah. It just goes on for so long. And it doesn't feel particularly interesting. I could see a trimmed down version of this where he either just kills them quickly or even just, you know, oh, we see him near this farmhouse. We can presume that's where he's been staying during the last two years. Yeah. No no one has come across this rundown, beaten down shack. Like, it's totally fine. (laughs) I, I definitely suspended my disbelief and just went with it because are you honestly telling me that no one saw him in the last 
700 something days okay. i mean hello halloween ends hiding in a sewer <sighs> I, why do you keep bringing it up i don't want to talk about it anymore folks we have a two and a half hour episode on it oh on god Patreon. did we go on it for that long <laughs> i believe we do yes Jesus. we had a lot to say <laughs> okay so back at the bracket house we've got the sheriff insisting that man was meant to eat meat because uh the other thing of note is that annie is health conscious she wants whole wheat crush she doesn't want to eat meat she and Lori have gone vegetarian yeah and bracket is not having it no because we've all got a little caveman inside of us and of course this is cross cut with Yes, folks, the dog does die because we see Michael eating it. Eat it. But again, mind meld, it makes Lori want to vomit because he's mm -hmm. eating the dog while she's eating her pizza. Yeah. Again, director's cut difference here. So she runs upstairs, she vomits, and like Annie runs up and like hands her a towel or something in a theatrical mm -hmm. cut. In the director's cut, we have this moment where Brackett like looks to Annie and he's like, go check on her. And she's like, fine, yeah. I'll go. I'll always go. Yeah. But we get this moment where she's helping Lori at the toilet and Lori goes to her, I'm sorry I was such a bitch earlier. Mm -hmm. Like, that, that again, that to me is a couple seconds of dialogue, but it's so important for the relationship between these two girls that this is included. Yeah, absolutely. And, and even that moment of hesitancy on any at the dinner table, right, where you can tell she has done this so many times, times mm -hmm. but then she fucking pulls it together and says okay yeah i'm gonna be that person for my lover i mean for my best friend and <laughs> and she goes to her and and i love this idea that yeah Lori is going to apologize because what do we do to the people we love the most we lash out at them because we know we can ask for forgiveness later yes unfortunately annie is nearing the end of her rope well yeah i mean two years yeah it works so well to really hammer home this idea that Lori is just not getting better, even though she wants desperately to get better, but she doesn't know how to stop. And I do think the film does a good job of escalating that as we get closer to Halloween. But yeah, from Annie's timeline, as you said, she's also been through trauma and she is quote unquote more well adjusted. She has recovered. It's like, girl, fucking let's get it together. I know. I know. Okay. So. We go to a black and white dream sequence as both young Michael and adult Michael speak to Deborah. <laughs> Ghost mama. <laughs> Ghost mama. And this is where we see Lori laid out on a table in front of what appears to be like a sawtooth jack sort of Halloween town kind of. Oh, my God. I, I was doing like her, her where she was lying. I was like, oh, this is like Snow White in her glass coffin. Sure. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Mm hmm. So this is when Lori wakes up and it's clear this has just been another nightmare. We get the October 30th card. So we're inching closer. And this yep. is where we see Michael entering Haddonfield. Nancy is complaining to Dr. Loomis that doing press in Haddonfield is kind of gauche, but he's here to do interviews. And also hit on the reporters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's where I realize, oh, we just are not meant to have any sympathy for this character at so all. So him being like, because she's like, oh, how long are you in town for? And he's like, oh, well, like, um, if someone can convince me to stay, uh, mm -hmm. that's director's cut. Oh, is it? Okay. Yep. Interesting. Because it really does sell him as a bit of a shit heel. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it's just adding fuel to the fire at this point. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. So this is when we get Lori's waking nightmare. Oh, this is the one with the glass coffin. The other one is where she's on the table. Right, 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 right. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. This one is more frenetically edited, and we almost... Yeah. There's a suggestion that Lori, as you said, is mind-melding with uh, Michael, but it almost looks like she is attacking Annie, and Annie is either dying from a throat slit well, or so something like that. I don't know if you okay, so basically what she does to Annie in this sequence, she has her like taped into a chair. Mm -hmm. That's how Michael Myers killed his stepfather in the prologue of the first film. Oh, okay. He, yeah, he like duct tapes into the recliner he stays in and slits his throat. So basically, yeah, so she, this is more connection to Michael. She's mm -hmm. killing Annie. So yes, that that's what this is. Okay. Yeah, I I didn't remember that, so I just thought, oh, this is kind of a stylish nightmare. <laughs> the reason I didn't rewatch that remake is because I've seen it enough <laughs> <laughs> fair fair mm -hmm. 
So this is when Lori goes back to Dr. Collier's office and mm. she has a full fucking meltdown about the insufficient amount of meds that she is being given. This entire sequence is just director's cut. And uh, I think... Honestly, I, th- I can't. Know. This is so vital. Because again, in that theatrical cut, it's like, oh, it's reading the book, finding out she's Angel Myers. That's what, that's, that, that is her breaking point that sets her off. And mm. it kind of works, but you're kind of like, oh, okay. No, like, it's that's too, a little, it's it, too late. And if there hasn't been any kind of yeah. buildup, it seems like, oh, she's flipping out over a book. And so yeah, all of this, because well, here's, because did you know the drug Haldol? Do you know what that was? Mm-mm. So I looked it up. It's a okay. drug to treat schizophrenia, which also Ooh. would explain why Lori is so angry when she, when she says, that's what I'm going to give you wow okay yeah that's significant i definitely thought that she was on sedatives or sleep aids or something yeah no like all of this and again so uh, this is all fantastic and then we jump to uh, again another fight between Lori and annie which is before we go ahead though there is one line i really want to highlight it to Mm -hmm. me is almost the central part of the Lori arc in this movie yeah she screams at dr coley as she says i'm not strong and i'm tired of pretending to be I just think that's so I mean, I don't want to say, oh, it's so fucking deep, but no, that rings so true to somebody where it it calls back to this. You know what? Just take it one day at a time and it'll all be fine. It's like, no, I'm not strong enough to just do that. It sounds rational, but this is emotional. This is post-traumatic stress. This is something that I can't control. Like this line to me embodies the idea that Lori She's not in control of how she's feeling, and she's tired of people telling her, don't worry, you'll be fine. You just have to give it a little bit more. It's like, no, I don't have that. That's why I said earlier, like, I think this to me is the most realistic portrayal of Final Girl PTSD. We mm-hmm. don't see this very often no. because it, it's not attractive. It's not a no, fun it's aspect. it's messy and dark and complicated. Yes. Like, I can see people looking at these kinds of scenes and saying, God, she's just screaming at her therapist. What a fucking bitch. And it's like... Yeah, yeah, because it's really rough. So my introduction to podcasts was actually a bloody disgusting podcast from way back in the day called Double Murder. Okay. And it was uh, two guys, I remember their names, but they would always compare a remake to the original. But oh, okay. Usually they were fine, uh, but they did not like this movie. And uh, when they when they had their episode on this versus Halloween 2, they railed into um, right. Scott Taylor Compton and was like, tell your dad Angel says fuck you, meh. And I confess that might have fed into my hatred of this character for so long because I right. listened to that episode. But again, looking back, I'm just like, God, what were we thinking back in 2009? Yeah. I mean, hey, you know what? Maybe this is progress. We don't look at things yeah. like this in the same way. I think there's probably a bunch of people who still watch this and say, oh, the performance is grating or this character. I just but that's I find the point. it difficult to get on her side. But I think more people are probably going to watch this and say, oh, we really tried to do something with this. Yeah. Yeah. I think what irks me the most is that no shade on the David Gordon Green trilogy, like whatever. Like even mm-hmm. like my opinions on that film divorced from that. The people talking about that trilogy, like it was doing something deep or extra or innovative with the, the trauma. And I was like, but we already again, did it. <laughs> we've done it before twice in mm-hmm. H2O and this movie. Yeah, well, it's really easy for people to write off H2O. And folks, we do have an audio commentary on that film as well. We talk a lot about how much we like Jamie Lee Curtis's PTSD performance in that one. Yeah, I think that film it's slight enough that people can just sort of make fun of it and dismiss it. I do think we've had a reappraisal of that film and people are far more on its side because of the David Gordon Green films. But yeah, I mean, we didn't have time or patience for this kind of complicated, messy performance, or we wanted to treat it like it was a joke. And and, and the thing is, it's not a joke, but no. I, I, I also understand the, 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 the gut reaction to be like, oh, I don't like this. No, you're yeah. not supposed to like this. This is exactly. not attractive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't like her because she's messy? Well, guess what? Welcome to real life. This is going to happen. Sometimes you meet people and they're going through fucked up shit and they're not shiny, happy people. No, no, not at all. <laughs> okay. Do you want to talk any more about the Annie and Lori fight then? Oh, well, so the, this Andy Laurie fight is all director's cut, which, again, I just because th- this is when, you know, Laurie's like, you know, what, Annie, I don't need your shit. And mm-hmm. Annie is like 
finally, finally, for the first time in this movie, stands up to Lori and is like, you know what? I am not buying this Mm -hmm. new Lori act. This is not real. You are forgetting that this happened to me too, blah, 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 blah. Yep. And then Lori, instead of saying, you know what? I understand. Just just like, get the fuck out of my room. Yeah. And Annie has this great line where she just looks at it and she goes, I am not impressed and just walks away. Yeah. This is so important. And again, Uh all director's cut. But like, it's, oh, this is a heartbreaking scene. And again, it works so well because these actresses are selling this fight. This feels mean and from the gut, right? You know, you can tell that they have been waiting to say these really hurtful things to one another for quite some time. And they've just hit that wall where they can't keep it inside anymore. Well, and that's the thing is, I'm really glad that you mentioned because I I truthfully didn't even think about the fact that, yes, Annie is clearly not handling things very well either. She's just handling it in in an equally unhealthy way, but Uh a more socially acceptable way. Just that, right? On the surface, when people look at the two of them, they're going to say, oh, Annie's fine because she is adhering to our socially conventional ways of doing things. Whereas Lori is having fucking meltdowns when she's handling pigs. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Is this a Frankenstein and he had a pig? And I'm like, girl, what are you talking about? Yeah, I was just like, oh, sweetie, somebody needs to hug her and give her a lollipop or something just... Let her have a moment. <laughs> no, give her some howl doll for that schizophrenia. <laughs> oh, boy. That is rough. Um, okay, but we're not there yet because we have to go to the rabbit and red strip club trays. <sighs> okay, I mean this like not even in a mean way, but Joe, why is this scene even in this movie? Because we need to up the body count and the band boys love them some stripper tits. And here's the thing. Here's the, thing. The, the kills are pretty good. Also, They're I love good. The, Fun anecdote. The studio asked that the stripper have a bikini or something and not be fully naked. So Rob mm-hmm. Zombie went out of his way to make sure she was fully naked for all of these scenes. <laughs> Petty. I love it. <laughs> uh, in, in terms of the plot, mm-hmm. why does Michael go here? I I do not know. It does not make any sense narratively. The only thing, because his mom used to dance there. Like, that's the only thing. Uh, okay. Because she was a stripper. Right. But... I don't know if there's any other reason besides that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, folks, if you haven't seen the film, we see the boss, Big Lou, who is played by Daniel Roebuck. He is dressing down an employee named Howard, who is played by Jeff Daniel Phillips. Uh, Howard goes outside. He gets his head kicked in by Michael. And then we see Deborah tell Michael that only a river of blood will bring the family back together. So this kind of kicks off the carnage candy for the rest of the film. So we break Big Lou's arm and then Howard gets hung with some kind of lighting fixture. It actually looks very similar to one of those kills in H2O. Yeah. But the big death scene here is this Misty Dawn character played by Sylvia Jeffries and this to me was the most extreme kill i think in the film (laughs) he just smashes this woman's head into a mirror about 25 times yep um it's rough i I have nothing to add to that except yes that that is what happens and it is rough But then you're you're absolutely right. You could just wholesale remove this scene. It we makes don't no even reference it later on. It's not as though we see a news report in the background that says, oh, you know, murder sequence had, you know, the rabbit lounge well, or whatever. Uh, I, I, th- oh, I could be wrong. I think, I think there is a sign or a banner or a billboard outside the strip club that advertises his mom. Loomis's no, book? No, his mom, Deborah oh. Myers. I say, oh, like she danced here. And <laughs> okay. I but because there there is a scene that is director's cut only later mm-hmm. where he's looking at something with Loomis's book, or maybe a book spread or something, and his mom is there being like, "Look, he's profiteering off all those murders and blah oh, that's blah." That's still to come. It's still to come, yes. But I guess maybe that would tie into then there's some kind of motive on Michael's part to be like uh, he's just going everywhere his mom was. I I guess. I, I don't know. I I don't know. <laughs> 
here's the thing if we've had to speculate about it for this long then the movie's either not done a very good job of clarifying it or it didn't do it at all which yeah. again tells me well maybe you need to cut this because it's not that important well, because the, and the robot character Big Lou is in that first movie. I I don't remember what he does. So un, unless there's some kind of thing with Michael where he's like, "You mistreated my mother." Right. Boom. Yeah. But but nothing in this film gives us that. No. No. And then we're just done with this because it's October 31st and we're moving the story forward. Yep. So we've got Sheriff Bracket apparently just going and buying this book first thing in the morning and then getting to the part where Loomis outs Lori as Angel. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I Is there a lawsuit that can happen with this from, like, review? Like, I guess, I don't know what even the case would be, but, like, this seems very unethical. Uh, and, and even the fact that, yeah, he either wouldn't have had legal look after it or had to give some kind of heads up. I don't know if her identity was privileged information and it was hidden in juvenile records or something uh but it's not as though she committed a crime so maybe (laughs) that's why it's just public knowledge no his book yeah um the myers gave their their baby angel up for adoption um this this person was attacked in the event two years ago and she went to go live with sheriff (laughs) schmacket No relation to Sheriff Brackett. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean for you folks to read this as Angel Myers. I meant it with the accent, like in Spanish, where it's it's actually <laughs> Angel. <laughs> Lori. I said Lauren Myers. <laughs> I spelt Lori with an O-R-I. Oh, Come God. on. That explains it. That explains it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, truths are coming out in this book. So Sheriff Brackett immediately calls Annie and is like, holy shit, keep Lori away from this book. But of course, we don't say it because we Dude, need to keep the reveal secret. I, okay, I hate that Annie never finds out about this. And no. I hate that. It's so weird. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. So uh, Annie, unfortunately, can't find Lori because she thinks that she left early, a.k.a. Oh, the girls never made up after their fight and Lori left. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, they will never see each other again until Annie is dying. Yeah, yeah, the worst. <laughs> oh, I, I have, I have many thoughts about that oh, death scene. Like they're good fucking thoughts, fantastic. but like fantastic. Yes, yes. It, it, for it being also the least gory death in the entire mm-hmm. movie. Like this is a, it, it's clearly a conscious decision on Ron oh, part to not show this kill scene. Yes. Pause. We'll get to it. Yes. Okay. So this is where we see adult Michael being told by Deborah. <laughs> that Loomis is profiting from their pain. And then we get to see this ginormous lineup of Haddonfield residents saying, yes, I would like a signed copy of this town's personal tragedy. This murder book. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Shout out to uh, NBC series Grimm. We've got a character named Chet, who is played by Silas Weir Mitchell. He was one of the standout actors from that show, which I watched religiously for like six or seven seasons. Oh, Chet, the bringer of death. Oh, my God. This character is terrible. (laughs) It definitely feels like a bit of a pointed critique against true crime enthusiasts and or murder bros. Yeah, kind of. Um, but so early, right? Um, I I didn't watch Graham. Actually, I didn't watch any of the shows he's famous for. But he's known for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, My name is Earl. He's in all four seasons of that show and okay. Prison Break. Oh, really? Oh, yes, yes, he was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He's he's kind of a fun actor. He usually plays comedic, so it was very weird to see him in this very brief role. But just somebody who is basically a Doctor Loomis fanboy. Mm, yeah. yeah i mean it doesn't matter because we got to shuffle him off stage so we can get linda vanderclock's dad yes indeed so kyle who is played by robert curtis brown literally pulls a gun on dr loomis pulls a gun <laughs> which we learn in the next scene was not loaded but it's just kind of these little scenes are very interesting they do feel almost like a blueprint of where david gordon green will go with the haddonfield has lost its g damn mind in halloween kills right yeah a hundred percent and that's the thing like you're watching these movies and you're like wow there wasn't really a lot of new ideas in that david gordon green trilogy <laughs> i mean admittedly he did dedicate an entire middle film to the concept whereas here it's 
more or less a scene or two. But yeah, we're not breaking a ton of new ground. No. Okay, so we hop in the limo, and this is where Nancy essentially says, you're disgusting, you're playing with people's lives, you're playing with fire, it's going to have repercussions. And <laughs> I don't know if Zombie edited. No, it had. this had to have been a comedic beat. I mean, like, it, it's funny, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not quite a smash cut, but it might as well be because we just go directly to Lori reading the book in her car and having a total meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, screaming fuck over and over, banging this book. I mean, like she is whatever sanity was in this girl before is mm -hmm. mostly gone by this point. Yeah. Oh, and I lied. It turns out she does actually have one more scene with Annie, but basically she just goes home oh. to yell at her yeah. because she thinks that Annie knew because Sheriff Brackett knew. Uh, and this makes everything about this ending more tragic, though, right? Because it's like, mm -hmm. oh my god, they, they just would have talked to each other. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What's the first rule of relationships, Trace? You gotta have those open lines of communication. Yep. And also good sex. Yeah, I don't think Annie and Lord are having that, but yeah. Well, no, because they're they're too affected by the trauma. Well, <laughs> nevertheless, tell him that Angel says, fuck you. Fuck you. Yeah, so Lori storms off. Uh, Sheriff Brackett does assign Deputy Neil, who is played by Greg Travis, to look after Annie. There's some fun little character beats. Maybe that's too strong a phrase, but I like that Deputy Neil says, oh, God, just like last year, uh, your daughter hates me. She's going to make me sit on the porch. Oh, yeah. And it'll 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 pay off later. <laughs> it does. Indeed. Yeah. So Lori ends up going to Maya and Harley. And this is where we get the reveal, because despite all of these fights and all of the weird, obscure phone calls from Sheriff Brackett, this is where we discover, oh, OK. Lori is actually Angel Myers. She is Michael's sister. Even though we knew that already, though. I mean, you can figure it out. I'll admit I had forgotten about this plot point, and I didn't know if we were going to replicate it because I know that people really don't like it from Halloween 2. Okay, but but it, it's it's literally a plot point in the first film. <laughs> oh, God, is it? See, yeah. I completely forgot. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. So in Rob Zombie's original, it's established. She doesn't know, but it uh, is okay. established. Like, we know. The audience knows. So this is Rob Zombie gaslighting us? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's it's for Lori, because Lori didn't know this in the first movie. Um, sure. But, but what I do love, that, <laughs> this is great acting from Bria Grant. She's like, I'm not me. I'm not me. Do you understand what the fuck I'm saying? And Bria Grant takes a beat and just goes, not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very much, oh, Lori is operating... She has spun so far out at this point that she's basically not on planet Earth with other folks anymore. Oh, she's not saying anything in a coherent way. No, th this whole scene, it does feel almost like a manic episode where yeah. you just think, oh, somebody needs to take care of this girl. A hundred percent. Which, in their defense, both the Maya do, and Harley yeah. do. They try to say, you know what, let's have a quiet night. We're not going to do Halloween. Let's stay in. And instead, Lori says, no, I want to get drunk. I want a fun party. <laughs> Biggest mistake ever. It's horrible. But in between these scenes, we have to spend some time at the Newman Hour Trace. <laughs> because Dr. Loomis is being interviewed by David Newman, a.k.a. one shitty, smarmy Chris Hardwick. Yeah, but I will say, um, <laughs> I like Weird Al Yankovic in this scene. <laughs> Grace, when I tell you I guffawed that he was there and playing himself and then also making fun of Dr. Loomis. Yes! <laughs> oh, no. The, 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 uh, honestly, Chris Harvey gets a really good line in here where he's like, oh, yeah, we all feel really bad for you, Loomis, but let's mm -hmm. continue. <laughs> <laughs> This, I think, is an expertly cut scene because you could tell that they probably shot a bunch more stuff for it. Mm -hmm. And then they trim it to, oh, we know just enough to know that Dr. Loomis was horribly humiliated on this appearance because he could not handle whatever was going on. Which he's such a fucking baby. Oh, yeah. Fun fact, though, uh, Chris Hardwick's audition tape is on this Blu-ray as well. <laughs> mm, it's going to be a no for me. Thank you. <laughs> I think he's right after uh, Octavia Spencer. So. 
I'm sorry. Do you mean Nurse Octavia Daniels? Daniels. Nurse Daniels. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We get this fun moment where a child runs into Michael and is confused because he thinks that Michael is Ugh. a giant. Every trailer. It was in every fucking trailer. It's mm-hmm. it's fine. But again, I'm going to kill a child. <gasps> you can cut this scene and it won't make a lick of difference. Yep. I debated whether or not to even raise it. Mm hmm. Uh, then, yeah, Drunk Lori says they want to go out, so we see them in their Rocky Horror costumes, and then Harley is strangled to death in the back of a shaggin' wagon after her date, Wolfie, who is played by Matt Bush, is stabbed while peeing. This is fine. I actually sure. like this. I don't know who this actor is, like, but like, nope. I <laughs> when she's like, I'm in it, I like a little golden shower, he's like, that's gross, but I'm coming right back. <laughs> Stop pink shaming, Wolfie. <laughs> Also, their their dialogue is a little bit colorful, but oh, it's funny though. I think it's kind of fun. It seems like oh, you're stupid twenty somethings who just met each other. And yes, and you're gonna fuck in the back of a van. It felt real to that situation. Absolutely. Um, I know we skipped over it briefly, but like, there's a little bit of Annie with the cop who's guarding her. Mm-hmm. And that's all director's cut, too. I mean, I think there's maybe someone where she shows up and she's like, oh, not you again. But like, yes. there's more, there's like a longer sequence. She's like, oh, I'm shaking in my boots. Like she does, she mm-hmm. taunts him more, which I think is really fun. I mean, more Danielle Harris, never a bad thing. Absolutely. And to me, it also highlights this is how Annie is faking it for other people. Yes. So she looks like she's totally got her shit together. She's gently making fun of this guy it actually does feel very barb and the police officer in black christmas to me where it's like uh you i'm making fun of you but at the same time honestly i've never been in a situation like either one of these girls but i Mm -hmm. feel like i'd be like yes please (laughs) oh my god i would say you're in the house i'm not leaving you outside (laughs) yeah a hundred percent i'm sleeping and you're sitting at my feet because i want to make sure you are here to protect me (laughs) (laughs) uh okay so we briefly see loomis watching his performance on the newman hour it doesn't look any better a second time around nope and then this is when laurie has another waking nightmare and this is of deborah inviting her to come home it's almost time to come home angel Hmm. Sure. Okay. Whatever. Yeah. I, uh, it's so funny because I feel like there was a replica of this scene in um Terrifier two last year, where you know she's seeing like the girl yeah. at the party seeing like a bunch of like ghost hallucinations. Hmm. I think it works fine here. I mean, yeah. it's, it's it's fine. Okay. Yeah. 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 It it's doing exactly what it needs to do. It's not particularly exciting or revelatory, but it's there and it accomplishes what it needs to. Yeah. Lori is slipping further and further into insanity. Yeah, unfortunately. Mm -mm. But uh, first, we have to get rid of Annie. And I'm not going to lie, this is a fucking masterpiece sequence. I'm in complete agreement. It's it's so funny because the first time I saw this, I felt robbed of a kill scene where I was like, oh, like why why don't I get to see her die? But honestly, I feel like if we had to see Annie die the same Mm -hmm. way anyone else in this movie dies, Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd be able to handle that. Yeah, we, we've emotionally invested too much in this character. Not going to lie, it's also Danielle Harris. So there's this a legacy protectiveness that we feel towards the actress and by proxy the character. Mm-hmm. But this feels mature. It seems weird to say that, but yeah. it's reserved in a way that makes it more effective. Like, I didn't need to see Annie get horribly mutilated in this bathroom because we know what's happening. And then when we do get the brief flashes of it intercut with Lori seeing the aftermath, I think it's so much more effective, but also just the fade to black and hearing Annie screaming and the sounds of the chaos I just think it's really, really effective. And so, because uh, I have complained about this camera effect before, specifically in Resident Evil Apocalypse, where it's like, oh, every time the zombies show up, there's this like weird blur effect that they they do mm-hmm. with the zombies. Zombie does the same thing with Annie here, but I do think it works because it it's playing out in slow motion, like this kind of surreal way where you're like, because yeah. at this point you realize you're like, oh my god, like yeah, she's going to die. Again. Absolutely, but, yeah, but. We don't see the death, and it uh, it almost gives you a glimmer of hope, where it's like mm-hmm. maybe she got away. But you're right; like before, uh, Lori and Maya even walk in the house, we hear the knife sounds mm-hmm. over just like shots of the front yard. Yeah. And 
is un- uncharacteristically restrained for zombie, mm-hmm. but it nails the emotional intent. Like you yes. feel so fucking bad and you have to go through not just one, Twice. but two people finding her body. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I'm not going to lie. One of them, I think, is really, really good. And the other one doesn't work for me at all. Oh. Yeah. It's wild. It's wild. So let's talk about the one that does work. So Lori ends up finding Annie's body. She is cradling her. I'm not going to lie. A large portion of my queer reading of these two women is does the come from the fact that suddenly we are calling Annie baby. And sure, that could be platonic friendship because it's your yeah. closest person in the world. But this feels romantically tragic to me. No, it's it, th- this is just it's so difficult to watch this it's like th- this no matter how you feel about Lori at this point in the film like mm-hmm. th- th- this feels like the Lori we know back in the game for mm-hmm. a brief moment before michael arrives again the other weird thing is that it feels like the emotional climax of the movie right yes. like sure we're about to get this kind of call for action where Lori is going to have to go on the run because her life is at risk and then we're going to build to a big action climax but this hurts this is the moment where everything has come apart for Lori. It's her lowest moment of the film. And it's all because of how much we have invested in the relationship she has with Annie. Ooh, and you know, because you know me, I don't like someone like knowing they're about to die, being like, mm-hmm. please, I don't want to die. And Annie doesn't say that exactly. But we get a flashback to her just looking up at Michael, just going, please. Yeah. Oh, boy. And we should also note, I mean, Daniel Harris is not a large actress. Like, she's she's very tiny. Like- and Tyler Maine is a fucking giant. So there is that moment where he appears behind her and she looks like a child. Yeah. It was, uh, apparently it wasn't just the emotional reason. That is part of the reason why they shot it in this way is because having Tyler Maine, who's like six foot whatever, and Daniel Harris, who is barely over five feet tall. Yeah. It would just I think I think Rizami said it would look too silly to, to show that. <laughs> that is wild because I would never describe this sequence as silly. He, no. He nailed it this scene is it's it's upsetting like there's no other way to put it it's just a very upsetting scene yeah i i would honestly argue i think it is the most effective moment in this entire film um i don't disagree with you i don't disagree. okay <laughs> i was like oh he's pausing <laughs> no 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 I, I was trying to think like is there something that i find more effective but no no, no. I, because yeah, you saying this is the emotional climax that is a hundred percent true because i do find myself a bit yeah less it, interested it, <laughs> in everything that happens after this yeah it it feels a little bit more like going through the motions yeah yeah i mean well and we'll talk about the ending but yeah Yeah. okay so unfortunately my husband sent to call the police because we don't have cell phones and that's fine so she runs downstairs she nearly manages to make the call but then she gets just yoinked back into the house and stabbed to death okay so a because i I did like this character quite a bit and i didn't know who bria grant was when i first saw this movie no but the way they shot this so they just put a block of wood next to bria grant's head Ooh. and they did oh because oh because rob zombie doesn't like using retractable knives he thinks they look fake oh so God, that's terrifying it was a real knife stabbing into this block of wood next no. to bria grant and i would just be like no please don't miss mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah this one isn't quite as brutal i think we're maybe getting six or eight stabs compared to the 20 something yeah. we typically get but yeah it it sucks it doesn't hurt as much as any at all but it very much feels like oh shit we're just losing all the characters we like at this point in case we didn't make this clear, Annie isn't dead yet by the time Lori finds her. She no. dies in Lori's arms. Which I think makes it extra hard to watch. Yes, it's horrible. Because <laughs> if she just discovered the body, it was like, no, Annie, no. And instead, you know, we have to get the hang in there, stay with me. Annie, and- stay with me. Yo, oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Annie is dead. Maya is dead. Lori goes on the run because Michael is breaking down the door. There's a shot where Lori is running. It's an extreme long shot. We see the moonlight yep. filtered past a single tree in the uh-huh. distance. Yeah. 
fucking gorgeous. It's so pretty. It's because I shocker. I rewatched the remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, recently. <laughs> oh yes, but but the, 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 there's like a piece of a section of woods or trees or whatever near the main house in that film mm-hmm. where Jessica Bill like runs through it like five thousand times. Sure. <laughs> but like the sun rays and the, and at night the moon rays like shine through the trees. Mm-hmm. This is very reminiscent of that, but this has that sixteen millimeter grain that the two thousand yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is lacking. Yeah, this honestly looks like I could imagine still photography. Yeah, print it, sell it, make a mint. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so it's time for Sheriff Brackett to come home to this okay. horrible crime scene. So this doesn't work for you full confession it's probably a personal thing i don't respond well to scenes where people scream no oh god no and i just didn't find durf convincing in this moment i think it was really honestly it was almost a little ham-fisted to me all right well fun fact for you so this did work for me i I, this breaks my heart every time but okay this is director's cut. Um, is it? Yes. So you do, in the theatrical cut, you do have him find the body, but mm-hmm. all of the oh God knows, none of that's in there. It's a very brief, like, he finds her and he's right. mad. Oh. I do want him to be sad because obviously... I mean, he, he is sad, but then he morphs to, to right. rage a lot faster. Okay. Hmm. Maybe I'll have to check it out and see if I prefer just, it. Just go watch that theatrical cut. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound better. I just... I don't know something about this. It plays too no. long. I mean, no, but, but that that that's why. Like, anyway, I didn't want to rewatch this theatrical cut, but I hadn't mm-hmm. seen it in fourteen years, so I was like, you know what? I yeah. I need to really know like how, how does the director's cut improve things, or <laughs> in some cases, not improve things. So I that's how why much I do this. I really hate that theatrical cut? I need confirmation. And look, like here's the thing: theatrical cut two out of five for me. Director's okay. cut three out of five for me. So it's a whole star's difference. That's big, um, yeah. But but again, it makes a fucking difference. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna lie. I think this is probably yeah somewhere between a three and a three and a half for me. Yeah, that's fair. Solid. I mean, if you said it was a five star film for you, that is also no. fair. <laughs> Trace, it's not Jason Goes to Hell. Let's oh, not. Oh get... right, right, right. <laughs> Let's not get wild. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Lori is on the run. We're headed towards the climax. She tries to flag down cars. It doesn't work. She ends up collapsing in the road. She ends up getting picked up by a very helpful, sort of cute guy. But uh, once again, slow as fuck. Dude, get the girl in the car. Drive away. Literally, he says, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Like like, like Mm -hmm. 10 times. And by the ninth time, Michael finally swoops in and kills his ass. But (laughs) I was just like, Sean Whalen, come on. Yeah, yeah. I will say, I like that it's not the usual stabby stabby, he's just dead. It's, oh, this dude's dead, and we're throwing him through the oh. windshield and pinning Lori in her seat. Um, And when that car flips, you can still see his body in that windshield. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, he <laughs> is in there. <sighs> and you could tell his head is clearly stuck on the steering wheel because we just hear the horn go in for, what, 15 seconds? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, Michael just lifts this thing, flips it over, and Lori mm-hmm. is out for the count. Yeah, so he does end up collecting her body. And then we get this slow motion Myers family walk as the car explodes. I don't mind this, actually. It's I think fine. it looks kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> It kind of feels like every other car is about to explode. We need to get out of here montage, but sure. Yeah, I mean, we haven't said this, but the, the young Michael Myers chase right Vanek is, is a recast because the oh, first okay. film's Dake Ferch, he grew too much. Two, two yeah, I was going to say two years for a child is they're not going to look the same. They both have the same kind of blonde mop hair, but like mm-hmm. they do look very different outside of that. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah. Mm. I mean... I don't know that much is demanded of the actor for this role. It's nearly silent, and we're just kind of hanging on to Deborah for most of the film. Yeah. <laughs> Deborah. Okay. So we're basically at the climax. We go to an abandoned shack. This is where Lori is forced to tell Deborah that she loves her, and the helicopters have found them. So we're in the police spotlight. This is where Loomis re-enters the picture. Nancy's gone, presumably, at this point, but Loomis is still kicking around, trying to be important. He just... (laughs) Bracket full-on is like, get the fuck out of here. 
yeah. my daughter is dead. I never want to see you. I blame you personally. And Loomis is like, da, 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 da. I'm just going to go in and talk Michael down. He's such an idiot. But, but you know what, though? It pays off exactly the way it should. <laughs> I will confess, though, I'm surprised. I mean, I think if we hadn't made the third film, you could very easily suggest Loomis survives all of this and he's perfectly fine. And... If you wanted to, you could read this as, oh, no, Michael fully kills him. And then when his body gets tossed out, he's basically dead. Yeah. OK, well, so here, let me tell you what happens in the theatrical cut. We'll just breeze through this really quick. Sure. So what happens is, yes, the police discover Michael's location and surround the shed. Loomis arrives and goes inside to try to reason with Michael. But mm -hmm. when he tries to resuscitate Lori from her hallucinations, Michael grabs Loomis and stabs him to death before being shot through the cabin window by Brackett and okay. impaled on a rake. <laughs> oh, mm, convenient rake. Apparently released from her visions, Lori walks over to Michael and stabs him to death with his own knife. Now, there's a moment where mm. Michael's like up against the, the 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 barn side door and she's like going to him and he's she's like, Michael, blah, blah, blah. And he like raises the knife as if he's going to stab her in the back. But then he like gives up. Uh, OK. Mm. So then the shed door opens up. Lori walks out wearing Michael's mask. What? And then we fade into the final shot of Lori in the insane asylum, like by herself, um, looking uh, at Deborah, Deborah, uh, walking you. towards her with the ghost horse. And she smiles and cut to black. OK, so what we get in these director cut, little similar, but also a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So Loomis barges in. Yeah, he tells Lori, hey, you're not actually being held down. This is all in your head. You just need to let it go. I like this, though. I think there's a really because again, because we see young Michael holding her down. Mm -hmm. And when she's yelling at Loomis, he's got me. He's got me. And he's looking at her like, you are crazy, bitch. Yeah, we see it from his point of view. And mm -hmm. she's just holding herself on the ground. She's just yeah, she's writhing around on the floor. I think this is all very effective. I do, too. Mm -hmm. I like it. So then we <laughs> it's almost comedic. We basically just cut outside to the police who are, you know, doing a standoff and we just see Loomis get thrown out the window. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. And then a billion snipers shoot Michael when he comes out after Loomis. And this is all in glorious slow motion. Okay, but this is where Michael gets a single line of dialogue in the entire franchise. Yes, he does. What does he say, Trace? Die! <laughs> well said, Michael. You've waited all this time to say one word. Hey, but you know what? He stabs the fuck out of Loomis, and Loomis is dead. Well, maybe. Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> I, I'll confess, I read this as, oh, we can absolutely get him to the hospital and he'll be fine, because we do that in these movies. Well, and but in the theatrical cut, he's definitely dead. <laughs> right. Yes. So Michael has been shot a billion times. Loomis has been stabbed. And then Lori comes out. She picks up the knife. And because now she is a woman holding a knife and we still have all these trigger happy cops, we shoot her a billion times as we play a slowed down cover of Love Hurts. And this song is not in the theatrical cut. Oh, that is an interesting choice. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay. It does feel a little melodramatic. Yeah, oh, 100%. But I do like this overhead shot because we have an overhead shot of basically the three corpses. It's Michael and Loomis mm -hmm. and Laurie. And, and Laurie's in the center. And we're just zooming in very slowly on her before we cut to the all white psychiatric ward. Um, uh -huh. Did you get a little bit of like, oh, she looks like she's been on the cross or she's laid out yeah. to rest? Like, I mean, she's not a martyr, but like, that's almost kind of the image I'm getting from this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But th this to me is telling the tragedy. Like what this, this poor girl. <laughs> well, I mean, bitch, why'd you pick up the knife? <laughs> well, so, th but that's the thing. So zombie says in the commentary, this is like, she has fully lost all of her sanity. And so she right. was going to the knife to go use it on Loomis. Oh, that that was what he, he believed her intent was. That does not come across. I mean, well, it, it kind of does because she moves towards Loomis, but it happens quickly enough that when she gets shot, it just kind of seems mm -hmm. like, oh, OK, yeah, they misinterpreted that she's a threat. So then question for you. So everyone, yeah, we will fade into this all white psychiatric ward. Lori sitting at the end of what appears to be a very long hallway room. Yeah. It feels like another dream sequence because this is immaculate. It is fictitiously white. Yes. And yeah, the hallway is impossibly long. And then, of course, we're seeing Deborah 
and her horse. So we've only ever seen mom in dreams. So part of me is like, okay, so what do we make of this ending? Is Mm -hmm. it that, yeah, she's probably in an asylum because she has lost (laughs) her mind, but she is now reunited with mom in the same way that Michael was. So that's interesting that you say that. So that that is absolutely how I read the theatrical ending because we don't see Laurie get shot up. Um, Mm -hmm. According to Zombie in this commentary in the director's cut, this ending, Laurie is dead. Oh, like this is basically it. yeah. it's basically her afterlife. She's been reunited with her mother. But again, because it, it ends like she, she does this like really evil, like malicious looking smile at the camera. Yeah, it's sly. Mm-hmm. Well, in the theatrical cut, because we haven't seen Lori been losing her mind for the whole movie, it reads as, <laughs> oh, OK, like this. Now she's in an insane asylum and she is now the new Michael Myers. Like she is right. insane. We're proposing a new film where she is the murderer. Yeah, Exactly. Whereas okay. this one, though, because we've seen her been she's been losing her mind this entire goddamn film and she has mm-hmm. lost all sanity by this point. Right. Granted, I, I don't know if I fully get, oh, she's dead. This is her afterlife like from this. Sure. Yeah. But that is the intent behind this. It definitely clicks when you tell me I actually feel a little bit stupid for no. not thinking that. But I also, again, I don't know that it's clear enough it, only because we've already seen a hospital sequence in this film. So part of me... I think just naturally assumed, oh, yeah, this is back in the hospital that we opened the film at. Yeah. And she's just hallucinating Michael's mom, ghost mama again, because yeah. Michael's dead. And why not? And because she was already seeing her when she was out Rocky Horroring. <laughs> yeah. But then this is the thing. Like, she wasn't gunned down by the police in the theatrical cut. She was gunned down by the police in the director's cut. So right. you're, you're supposed to be like, oh, yeah, she no one's coming back from that. <laughs> <laughs> truly because it's not as though she gets shot once or anything she gets shot a bunch well and that's the other weird thing too so okay, so she, she smiles we cut to black and we go into the credits and what plays uh-huh. over the credits are still images of all the deaths from both films yeah which eh. well here's the thing though so in this cut it's love hurts that slow down version playing over it in the theatrical mm-hmm. cut it's the tyler bates's redo of the halloween theme playing over all this huh. which one do you think works best um, I don't need to see any of these deaths again. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. Um, no, I mean, I think it's, I like the Love Hurts version because, again, it sells that melancholy. At the end mm-hmm. of the day, th- this whole film to me. It's this, a tragedy. Well, it's a tragedy. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, it is what we don't want for Laurie Strode. Like, the Jamie Lee Curtis Laurie Strode, like, she could never. Mm-hmm. And so this is so profoundly sad and upsetting for me. Right. So I think Love Hurts plays better. I wish it wasn't just a cover of Love Hurts. I wish it was something else. Yeah. Yeah. But but, but playing the Halloween theme over it almost feels like a celebration of this stuff. Whereas Mm -hmm. this at least feels uh, uh, thematically appropriate. I'm inclined to agree. Yeah. And also, it just feels like you're doing yet another homage. Oh, wait a year. We'll have another movie for you, which I guess at the time of release, that's what the theatrical cut was probably meant to accomplish. But as a discerning viewer of a certain taste who appreciates an excerpt that opens the film, I kind of like the yeah, you know what? This movie's sad. We're done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, I, again, I, I think this film is... It's trying some stuff. It's a more clear vision than that first film, clearly. Like, mm-hmm. I still think there's some studio interference here. I think you can see that in some of the more, um like, slashery, Halloween-y type things here. Yeah, hey, can we get, uh, can we get another action sequence in there? Maybe kill a stripper? Yes, but I appreciate that it's more in line with what Zombie wanted to do and probably what he wanted to do with that first film. Not mm-hmm. all of it works. There's way too many cooks in the kitchen in terms of plot stuff here. Right. But yeah, I the stuff I like, I really, really, really like. And mm-hmm. I, again, I, I admire Zombie's brazenness uh, with the direction he took this film. Yeah, I agree. It's all about the Lori Annie stuff for me. And the PTSD stuff is genuinely effective. I think it's well handled. I do agree with you. I think this is probably the closest we're going to get to a reasonable depiction of it like we're not trying to sensationalize it we're not trying to cushion it or make it palatable for audiences i do think that that's going to be off-putting for some people but i also think that's literally what the movie is about a hundred percent absolutely so i don't know i mean i don't know if we're going to convert anyone on this film but i do hope we at least inspire people to give it a second chance if they hated it 14 years ago 
Yeah, particularly if you've only ever seen the theatrical cut and now you're experiencing this director's cut for the first time. Absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, yeah I mean, like, look, buy the Blu-ray, just... <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't watch that theatrical cut. <laughs> Trace will Venmo you some money so that you can afford to buy the Blu-ray. I'll Venmo you a kiss emoji. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Well, that has been Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. And, uh, well, I guess the, the end of spooky season almost. Mm hmm. Yeah, oh, we're about God. to take a hard left turn. I was going to say before we announce what we're covering next week or the theme for next month, because it is a theme month. Mm -hmm. If you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at horrorqueers. Shoot us an email at horrorqueers at gmail.com. Find us on Letterboxd to keep track of all the films we've covered. Go to our YouTube channel to check out our interviews with various horror filmmakers and tune in once a month to hear about our most anticipated horror films for that month. If you want to chat with other listeners, please join our Facebook Horror Queers group. And because it is almost Halloween, what better time to give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify than now? Mm -hmm. If you've done it already, thank you. We love you. If you haven't done it, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? <laughs> I was going to say, Julie James that shit. Let's go. <laughs> go, please give us a five-star rating. We have like 650 reviews on Apple Podcasts. I would love to hit 700. So 50 of you, go do it. <laughs> Here we go. Such a doable number. And you know what? Don't wait for other 50 people. If you're one of those, you do it. You do it, yeah. But um, yeah, if you want even more content, please support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horrorqueers. If you subscribe today, you'll get almost 268 hours of Patreon content, including this month's new episodes on It Lives Inside, No One Will Save You, Totally Killer, Saw X, The Exorcist Believer, and our audio commentary on John Carpenter's classic original Halloween. Yes, it's yeah. it's fun to do multiple Halloweens in a short period of time. Oh God, but but Joe, mm -hmm. what's not going to be any less depressing is uh next month. So uh, what are we doing? Here we go, folks. We teased this when we were talking about erotic thriller month back in September that we had one more theme month, and here we go, November. Uh, it's gonna be. I don't know, Trace. This could be a huge fucking mistake. But uh, the theme for the second last month of this year is toxic masculinity. Oh, boy. So if y'all thought Laurie Strode was annoying and, and uh, not likable, um, we've got a lot of men mm -hmm. <laughs> who are not going to be very likable next month. <laughs> yes, but we have tried to change up the film. So we're not just looking at the same sort of depiction of it. I think we're going to have some really interesting conversations, but uh, we're going to yeah. start it with a rough one. So we're going to kick off Toxic Masculinity Month with Michael Haneke's Funny Games. Uh, so the, the, uh, if you're living in the States, the original is uh, streaming like included in, in Max at this time. Uh, you have to rent to watch the remake. However, I will say this. You could probably watch either version <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and be 100% fine because this is... I mean, I think this is the most basic example of a one-to-one -one remake. Like, it's the exact same script, the exact same shots, the exact same... I, I think this is more of a, of a copycat remake of the original than Psycho is. Right. And of course, we should note, it is the same director. So he's yeah. remaking his own film only for American audiences. Yeah. So we will be mainly covering the original. However, if you only have the remake, um, you will be fine. There you go. There you so. go. But uh, yeah, until that discussion, <laughs> we can cross out Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Indeed, and cross out horror queers. Atlas Avenue, a long stretch of road that encompasses everything the city of Kennet Heights has to offer. Neon lights, traffic, crime, the hustle and bustle of everyday life, and the craziest of characters. My office was above it all. My name is James Locke, and I'm a P.I. Hello, Mr. J. How the hell you doing today? Good, Edith. Nearly every year I have a new case. New people to meet, new clues to discover, and new problems to solve. But I do it the old-fashioned way. No technology. 
Nothing post-1950. Hell, I don't even listen to podcasts, but you should. Atlas Avenue Beat is a spoof of the film noir genre with goofy characters, tons of wordplay, and non-stop raunchy humor. There's also three whole seasons out right now with more on the way. Just search for Atlas Avenue Beat wherever you listen to podcasts or visit us online at bloody.fm.